CSFI events since we have joined at IBF. And I'm very excited to have John Plender with us. Um, so let me just first speak about CSFI. We stopped uh, being uh, an independent standard, standalone think tank this summer. We are very, very happy that we have been uh, welcomed by the uh, by LIBF, by the London Institute for Bank of Banking and Finance. And uh, this is a very exciting new chapter for us. And, um, and I thought that for first event, it will be good to look at the past, look at the future. And no, I couldn't think of anyone better than John Plender, who has been the chair of the CSFI Advisory Council for many years to, to help us and to, to give us some insights on, uh, on the financial services sector, the role of think tanks, and, um, and, and what should we do next? I just thought that maybe we could look back at uh, when CSFI was funded. That was in 1993. And I was looking, thinking 1993, wow, this is the ERM debate. Yes, it's the last conservative government before the uh, 97 victory of Tony Blair. Um, and uh, and you know, we are kind of in a similar situation in many respects. Uh, internally in the UK, divided over Europe. Hmm? Um, you know, quite a few corruption scandals or any type of scandals. Um, but at the same time, the world is in such a different place. Uh, in 1993, that was uh, after the Paris Troika. Hmm? It looked like if uh, the capitalist was the big banker, democracies, then the world will get better and better, more secure richer, more prosperous, and now we are seeing an, uh, an incredible fragmentation, the risk of uh, uh, very, very uh, high tensions and maybe war not only with uh, Russia, but with China. Um, so what does that mean for global Britain? Well, I think it's uh, not a happy environment for global Britain. I mean, the fact is the world is moving uh, towards a, a bipolar system in which the big trading blocks are the US, uh, the Eurozone and China. And having done Brexit, um, Britain has lost its bargaining power that it had within the European Union and is going to be squeezed very considerably. Um, the fact is the world is going more protectionist. Uh, we've got a, a subsidies war taking place and um, we do not have the clout to handle a situation like that very well. So. Global Britain, gosh, it's going to be a very tough time for so-called global Britain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it was missed time, huh? the Brexit. Uh, well, uh, in, in fairness to, to the leavers, they were not to know that Donald Trump would win the, the presidency in the US and that he would turn the world in a dramatically protectionist direction. But having said that, um, you know, I think, uh, well, let's not relive the Brexit debate. But anyway, we're in a tough place. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean in terms of the UK economic institutions? Do you think then they are fit for purpose for, uh, for these challenges? Well, uh, all things in economics are relative. Uh, I would say that if you're talking about the Treasury and the Bank of England, um, all central banks have uh, suffered reputational damage since the financial crisis. Um, I don't think the Bank of England has been any worse than the others. Um, I think the Treasury is still a relatively effective institution, even if you don't like Treasury orthodoxy. So I don't feel that on the institutional uh, front that, that Britain is disadvantaged relative to others. Yeah. Not even on an institutional side. I mean, one of the things, and um, uh, as uh, coming from a more European background, is then uh, the you know elections in Europe also sometimes lead to very radical uh, leaders. No? But yeah. because the uh, institutional setup, the written constitution is much more heavy and much less flexible, it enables less radical action to take place in a short time, which is very bad news when that radical action is positive. But paradoxically, sometimes having more uh, belts and braces can help steer the world. When, um, um, when you have a very radical leader elected? Well, I, I take your point, and uh, we don't have a written constitution, um, but I still think that within 
the British style of democracy, there are checks and balances. Um, but we do suffer from, and have suffered recently, from populist politics, but then so have so many other countries from the US all across Europe. Um, so we're not an exception in that regard. Mm. The only thing is I think that the, the past uh, uh, 12 months have been quite extraordinary. And by this, uh, we have performed unbelievably badly by any standard. That's my question, <laughs> trying to find a reason other than uh, Ukraine in inflation. Um, but uh, 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 what does it mean? Uh, let's move on to the financial sector, yes? Right. Huh? So uh, one of the big changes also uh, compared with uh, when the CSFI was funded huh, is uh, uh, it was funded at the, you know, when globalization was expanding and uh, global banks were expanding incredibly quickly not fueling that globalization. And not only, uh, this was not just US banks, but it was uh, British banks, it was French banks, it was German banks. Um, the European banks, I think, uh, got, uh, I mean, the wings were really uh, cut during the financial crisis. Um, the Chinese banks, I don't think, are able to replace them because uh, probably because the RMB is, is not a full currency. And, uh, you know, they, they don't have the home currency that will enable them to play a global role. Um, and the US banks are now being curtailed by the US-China fragmentation. So how, what does that mean for the city and for the role as a, as a global financial center? Well, I think, first of all, we have to accept that the US, US banks have swept the floor in investment banks. Mm -hmm. The fact is mm -hmm. that the, the British and the continental European banks are not uh, effective players in the, the big investment banking league. Um, I think that in terms of uh, where things go for the city as an international financial center, there's still a lot of impetus. I mean, the foreign exchange market is a huge industry still. Um, we've lost some business because of Brexit to continental Europe in securities and in commercial banking, but not a, a huge amount. And it seems to me that financial centers um, they have, um, they do tend to have staying power, and historically they've lost, uh, they've lost their preeminence, usually as a result of war, and we, um, there, there is nothing quite equivalent to that, and um, Brexit, I don't think, has done really serious damage to the city as an international financial centre, although it's done some damage. Yeah. Um, and... And do you think then the government is uh, the current government is right to think then uh, by uh, making the city more competitive, it will have a, a, a positive impact on the UK domestic economy? Well, obviously, the, the government has to be concerned about job generation and tax revenues, and so it doesn't want a weak city. Uh, I'm um, a, rather a maverick in the sense that I think that what the 2008 financial crisis showed was that the city is actually the Achilles heel of the British domestic economy and did a lot of damage to the economy. And so I feel that the city was too large in relation to the British economy and that um, excessive risk taking and poor regulation resulted in serious damage to the way the, the economy worked. So I'm not very keen on the idea of government promoting the city, or CSFI acting as a kind of cheerleader for city interests. Yeah, that takes us to the CSFI very neatly. So um, what did, what do you think was the CSFI role in 1993 when it started, and what should it be now and look, looking forward in the next few years? Well, in 1993, um, you were looking at a city which had expanded dramatically off as a result of the Big Bang and the internationalization of the city. Um, and there was a lot of structural change going on. And so the idea of looking at financial innovation was extremely valuable. I think that as um, CSFI progressed, it also became very much involved in examining regulation and the impact of regulation on um, the, the way financial markets worked. And I think um, also it was very interested in trying to make that, encourage people to make the financial system more inclusive. And um, so, uh, but 
Above all, I think what it did was it was very good at identifying issues which were going to become important and sensing what was in the air and what its, um, its members wanted to know about and, and, and identifying good things to, to debate and to produce uh, publication for. And, and looking, um, looking forward, do you think that the focus should be also on, on creating this uh, safe space for debates no? or doing more research or, and, and which type of topics do you think the CSFI should? Well, I think CSFI should do focus. all of those things. All of the six, of course. And, um, but I think that uh, one of the things that we've learned, again, as a result of the financial crisis in 2008, is that a great deal of financial innovation is essentially about regulatory arbitrage. And uh, a lot of what went wrong was that um, banks seeking to get things off their balance sheets used complicated vehicles. Um, and basically, they were trying to get around the capital adequacy requirements. Um, the, the situation today is that the, because of the re regulation of banking after the crisis, you've got risk migrating to the non bank financial sector. And, um, and I think there's room for. Uh, examining um, both innovations taking place in the non-bank financial sector and uh, regulation and seeking ways of identifying where systemic risk might arise. And a good example of that migration of risk is what happened in the, in the pension funds in hmm. September and October when the gilt market seized up because of the quirks of liability-driven investment. LDI, obviously hmm. a financial innovation, and one in which the, the central bank's bank and the regulators didn't identify the potential threat that it posed to the gilt market, which is, after all, the heart and the bedrock of the British financial system. So it was a, an extraordinary shock. And, and what that demonstrates is the, the value of constantly monitoring and looking at financial innovation and, and talking about regulation. Yes, um, it did remind me, the LDI, of the AIG example yes. in 2008 crisis yes. yes yes and in which we discovered that uh, the banks all had uh, um, exceeded the large exposure limits to aig yes. without yes. knowing it yes huh? yes that's right so it, it it is difficult as a regulator because you have to go through many many loops and the transparency it's a, it's a, it's a clear clearly an issue um now when we speak about innovation now most people speak think about Digital currencies, crypto, fintech. How, how, how do you how do you see this? Because these are slightly different than the arbitrage. At it one is. Level. Yes, it, it is. is. It's, it's uh, really the I, technological innovation pushing. Well, I think there's been a lot sectors. of nonsense going on in crypto, um, but I think the um, the technology behind it is powerful, but has yet to find the, um, enough good uses. Um, but I suspect that they will emerge in, in due course. But I think that certainly something that CSFI obviously has to follow very closely is the way central banks are talking about uh, adopting ways of doing digital currency, because I think that is bound to come. And if you look at what's going on in China at the moment, or what's going on in Sweden and mm -hmm. Europe, we are moving to, to cashless societies. Yes. And so this is something that uh, clearly CSFI can do valuable work on. No, it is in our program of work. Yes, we are going to the work on digital currencies. Um, it's, uh, I, I also would like to explore, however, the, the idea of uh, central banks losing monetary sovereignty if uh, there was the emergence of all the digital currencies. Do you think that will be interesting too? I think the central banks are already fighting back and will find a way of um, monopolizing uh, the digital currency world. And I think that um, it's interesting to see the way uh, you know, Facebook retreated from its plans to, to do digital currency. Um, yeah. and, and I think that uh, there's, a, there's a real um, problem now with the things that have gone wrong in the crypto market. Um, uh, that there is, uh, I feel, um, the world is going to be much more skeptical of it in the future. But I, I feel that the central banks will manage to reassert sovereignty and that, that they won't allow this to roll them over. 
Yeah, that's possible. What about the future of banks? Will fintech change banks in uh, in such a way that we won't recognize them um, and uh, and really accelerate this intermediation? I think there is a real possibility that that will happen. The only thing I would say is that um, if you look back historically, I mean, at the end of the 70s and the early 80s, everybody thought that IBM was going to destroy the banks. Yeah. And it didn't happen. Um, uh, this time, though, I feel that um, the impetus behind uh, the, techno the technology and, uh, and fintech is, is a more powerful thing. And the incentive for the big tech companies to get into this market are greater. Um, and uh, so I think that disintermediation will take place on a, on a much greater scale than it did in the 1980s. Yes, yes. I mean, and even digital currencies, of course, can, uh, depending how they are introduced, can accelerate this intermediation yes. quite fast if we all end up having a savings account directly in the central bank. Uh, yes. Which it doesn't look like if right now this is uh, the main plan of many central bankers, but mm. the technology will enable them to do that. Hmm? Indeed. Um, and uh, and from a global perspective, what do you think about the de-dollarization? And uh, and uh, I saw a recent article on uh, from you on safe assets, yes, and the dollar as a safe asset. I mean, obviously, if you have a multi-currency world, maybe you do have the financial services will have to treat safe assets in a different way, yes, because you it won't be just dollar and your home currency. But maybe other things, or maybe not. How do you see that dynamic? Well, playing I, out? I see two different issues here. One is that if we are moving to a bipolar world with US at one extreme and China at the other, then clearly there is a possibility that the dollar's role as uh, the preeminent reserve currency could be uh, eroded, and, and it will be to a degree. Um, but I, I don't share the view of those who think it will happen very rapidly. I think that uh, if you if you look at the US Treasury market. You just had some problems with liquidity, notably in March 2020, but it's still the biggest, deepest sovereign debt market in the world. And the question is, what is the alternative? Well, the alternatives are still not very attractive. As for China, the sovereign debt market is very Ill illiquid, and the political risk mm. in China is huge. So I think that the, the erosion of the dollar's role is a much slower thing than a lot of people think. Now, the separate issue is of, of safe assets is that um, this is a sort of uh, an idea cooked up by economists and uh, to suggest that um, sovereign debt has been a safe asset through the biggest bond bubble in history is quite extraordinary. And I think that, um, uh, and I think also this ties in a little bit with the LDI thing. Um, I think that, uh, you know, um, I, I think, there should be more risk taking going on in the pension fund system. But the trouble is, uh, yeah. that reg regulation has made it unattractive for employers to continue with the defined benefit scheme. And it suits them very well to neutralize risk by going down the LDI route. The only thing is that if you were in deficit and, uh, and took on leverage, you were not neutralizing risk, you were taking risk. Yes, yes, that's a. Uh, um... We are back a little bit into the derivative. Yes, the, yes. the, 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 the uh, hedging is never a perfect hedge. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's only perfect when things are stable. It's quite clear that uh, there, there are many things that are happening in the LDI crisis that uh, brought great memories of the 2008 crisis. Yes. Um, now, what else do you think will be the greatest changes coming forward that we should focus on? Both from uh, internal to financial services and external forces that will impact the industry. Well, I think that you've focused already on, on the key things, um, disintermediation and what is going on in the non-bank financial sector, which is so opaque. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, a focus on uh, the monitoring and examination of risk should be right at the heart of everything the CSFI does. And I think if you were setting up the CSFI today, yeah. instead of calling it the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, I think you might call it the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, Risk and Regulation. 
Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not sure if I want to have a longer name. I know, but, uh, yes. But, uh, yeah. but, uh, mm. but I take your point, yes. Mm. Um, now, you haven't mentioned sustainable finance. Well, uh, clearly, that is, a, that is a, a very important area. And I think, um, and I think one thing that um, CSFI could do, actually, is to look at sustainability um, more generally, because I think you can see that um, things are going in a very peculiar direction at the moment with decarbonisation, because I'm not convinced that the accountancy profession is anywhere near on top of this, because the fact is that, that there are many companies in fossil fuel intensive sectors uh, whose assets are worth a great deal less on the basis of uh, current plans for decarbonisation that governments are proposing. Um, the value of these assets uh, is being severe, severely impaired. But you are not seeing impairment charges coming through in company accounts. You're not seeing depreciation schedules being revised to reflect this reality. So I think there's a, there's a lot to look at in the reporting area on decarbonisation and, mm -hmm. and the, the accounting for it. Yeah, that will be, um, that will be an interesting way to, to look at it. But I have the feeling that the accountants, uh, accountants, um, accountancy profession, it's still um, uh, very much based on carbon market value, yeah, on, you know. And so yes. the, um, I need to do, to have an impairment, you need to have a, a very clear signal, then that impairment will take place. And regulatory risk um, might be considered too uncertain. Well, you, you were entirely right, but that um, impairment charges, that, you know, they are, uh, they, are, they are matters of very difficult judgment, but that's what professions are for, to make difficult judgments uh, about value. I mean, I think the, the other big problem in accounting is that um, it, 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 it has not found a way of addressing the, the information of the economy in the sense that um, uh, so much of the value in the modern economy is in information. Um, and none of that appears in company accounts. Yes. Yes. Um, do you think then disclosure is going to be sufficient to really change the behavior of the finance industry? And not only to change the behavior, but to drive the transition to net zero? No, I think that. Um, it, it can do a, a certain amount, and investors are, are applying more pressure to companies to um, reveal and pursue um, plans for tra the transition to low carbon. But in the end, I think it's government policy um, and, and uh, the wider adoption of carbon pricing that have, has the key to making this transition. I don't think that investors and companies unaided are going to be able to do that much. Yeah, carbon pricing is another of the issues that I, I, I really want to see as a to look at. Yes, good. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and maybe, you know, change a uh, sustainable finance program, but change the focus slightly to look much more in depth at yes. different yes. options to, to change the pricing of carbon. Um, now, you have written uh, uh, extensively about ethics and moral capitalism. And um, including this, this book in 2015 uh, called Capitalism, Money, Morals and Markets. Why did you decide to write that book? Well, it seemed to me that um, capitalism has a legitimacy problem. On the one hand, um, it's lifted millions of people out of poverty, most obviously in Asia in the last 30 years. Um, but at the same time, um, you've had these constant financial crises. Uh, you've had um, increasing in inequality, um, you have the boardroom pay issue, all those kind of things. And I thought it was worth just trying to uh, assess what capitalism had done. Um, and it seemed to me that in the end, you know, my verdict, rather like Churchill's on democracy, is that it's uh, the worst system known to man, apart from all the others. Um, and, but, we need to make the case for it, but we also need to make the case for a better capitalism. And I think there is, um, there is a move uh, happily in the world towards um, thinking about more responsible ways of doing capitalism. 
uh, which I think is is very healthy. But I think we've got a long way to go. And and what do you think are the tools to to, to better that? Well, the, the the tools are essentially um, sort of political. Uh, I mean the the politicians hold the hold key. But having said that, I think a, a good commentariat, whether the media, uh, think tanks, uh, or whatever, is part of the process. The only thing I would say, though, is that uh, the power of the media in these kinds of areas is, um, it, is it's sadly not that great. I mean, I wrote uh, many columns for the FT before the financial crisis warning about an excessive uh, credit cycle in, in which there was excessive risk taking and, and regulation had been eroded because the regulators have outsourced the main risk management mm -hmm. task to that to the big banks. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that didn't make any difference at all to what actually happened. Um, so I think the, our ability as, as journalists and as think tankers to, uh, to change the way the world works is actually quite limited. In the end, it's the politicians and the central banks and the regulators that have to do the job. Yeah. And so what do you think of the new uh, consumer duty introduced by the FCA? Because uh, to me, that's an, to an extent, it's, it's an attempt to codify behavior yes. and to be able to regulate behavior. Um, well, I think uh, anything that's de designed to make um, the financial system more consumer friendly, I think has to be a good thing, um, but uh, my my concern is that the way politicians think about regulation at the moment is that they're, they're talking about wanting to make the, the, the city more competitive, things like that. Yeah. I think that um, you know the, the the most important job of the central banks and the reg regulators is to protect the economy and to protect the public from systemic risks, and I I don't want um, banking to be more competitive. I actually think, I, you know, what the one of the lessons of the financial crisis was really the banking system should be much more like a utility than a competitive industry, um, because that would protect the economy from the kind of disaster we had in 2008. No, me, I would like it to be also more uh, productive. Yes. Um, I, well, I have been very surprised looking at uh, some uh, um, Academics uh, then uh, uh, can show that the cost of uh, this of intermediation have not changed in a hundred years, um, and yes. uh, and you know then the system maybe not that you know the, the innovation that has been uh, um, adopted by the financial services sector has not really resulted in cheaper finance. Well, that is a good counter argument to my. my argument about competition and not liking competition. The fact is that the costs of financial intermediation in the advanced countries are far too high. And as you say, they have remained high over a very long period. Um, but I, I think that um, the remedy is in place. The fact is that FinTech and um, the, um, uh, the likelihood of far greater disintermediation will finally address that problem. So I don't think uh, that, that trend of uh, constant um, high cost of financial intermediation can be sustainable. I think it will, those, those costs will come down. No, I, I hope so. I, mm. I think that we might need, uh, um, or I want to look at the, whether we need to have a, a more robust competitive uh, framework, regulatory framework, in order to ensure that indeed FinTech uh, delivers uh, these results. Um, and on inclusion too. Yes. Yeah. Um, what about disinformation? Going back to journalism, hmm? um, because the other big innovation at the moment, of course, we all seem to be upset, obs uh, obsessed with uh, Chat GPT. Uh, so, um, and uh, and I was wondering, I mean, uh, whether this information, it's uh, you think it's uh, a, a risk whether it's uh, increasing, whether the artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence might reduce it or not, and, uh, and how does it affect the financial journalism? Well, I think there, there, there is a real problem as a result of the arrival of social media, and, um, and it's a problem that will remain with us. And the trouble is, as 
as journalists, um, we, it's, it's, it's a long, hard slog. Um, we chip away, but uh, I don't think we'll ever eliminate this problem. And it's just a result of the way the world has evolved. Um, and we just have to go on doing our best to counteract it. But um, it's, a, it's a hard slog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then to conclude, John, yes. Um, so you have been working as a financial journalist for many years. If you were starting again your career, would you do it again? Or would you choose a different career? I think I would do the same. Um, and the reason is that um, financial journalism is a, a wonderful window on the world. All human life is there in the financial system. Um, it's, uh, you're looking at um, all sorts of human motivation and all sorts of very interesting outcomes. And I, I'm fascinated by economies. Um, and I'm fascinated by the financial system. It's constantly changing. Um, it's dangerous. Um, and it's exciting. Yep. Yes, I agree with that. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this job either. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure speaking to you. Well, my Thank pleasure. you.